Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Heart Speaks podcast. In this episode, I speak with Rafe Kelly, founder of Evolve Move Play, an organization that's dedicated to getting people off the couch and moving their bodies out in nature and the outdoors. Now, why is this important? Because as human beings, our bodies were designed to move. And in fact, we can't actually have a sense of meaning without movement. In this talk, we discuss why that is, and we dive into other juicy topics, like why some movement practices are worth pursuing more than others, why roughhousing is essential to developing empathy, and how you cannot be truly nonviolent unless you are capable of being violent and consciously choose not to use violence. Spicy, I know. As always, subscribe, share, like, and above all, I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you. Okay, so Rafe, you are the founder of an incredible organization called Evolve Move Play. I was taking a look at your website this morning, and I was looking at all the different uh, inspirations that have informed this organization. But before we go into any of that, why don't you tell my audience what Evolve Move Play is, what the philosophy behind it is, and why you created it? Yeah, so the, the idea of the brand name, it is kind of the idea, the original idea at least was in the brand name. Mm. We evolved from movement and we evolved to learn movement primarily through play. So how do we take that power and help people um, develop more meaningful and more sustainable movement practices? Mm. So I have a background. Um, I've done parkour for 17 years. I've done martial arts for something like 30 years. Um, and I've also done gymnastics and capoeira and, you know, any number of other movement practices, CrossFit, you know, et cetera. So uh, uh, that was the, the essential idea. As it's developed, I really became interested in the idea that the reason that I was moving was because it gave meaning to my life. Mm. So it, it, movement practice unlocks meaningful experience. So then why yeah and how do we cultivate that better and how do we put that into an ecology of practices so then I, I became deeply inspired by Jordan Peterson's work and started looking at this kind of mythological framing of like movement as a hero's journey and then later I became good friends with John Berveke and started thinking about movement as part of an ecology of practices which had sort of developed naturally through through the retreats that we gave where we had just students who then became coaches who worked with us who came from the wilderness awareness school tradition and so they brought in elements of ritual and nature connection and then we became much more intentional about the community aspect of what we were doing and we started layering in the mindfulness so eventually we came to this idea of an ecology of practices of movement mindfulness nature connection and community which really interestingly beautifully aligns with like the four e's of cognitive science it's yeah. like through movement and um through movement and mindfulness we're able to get into the embodiment mm -hmm. of the self and then through the the parkour practice and the nature connection practices we really start to understand how we're embedded in the broader environment and then through rough and tumble body-to-body -body practices dialoguing storytelling that starts to then help us really deeply understand and better attune ourselves to the social relational environment so yeah. that's kind of the the um uh, one version of the story of EMP in, in, in quick in the quickest way I can sure. say. So it sounds like it was a very iterative process. How long would you say it actually took to sort of layer on all of those different elements that you just mentioned? Yeah. Um, so I started parkour, uh, like I said, 17 years ago, and I was an anthropology student at the time. And uh, right away, it had this sense of I was I was teaching gymnastics, and so it's like when I saw parkour, it was kind of like discovering the primal underpinnings of gymnastics mm. um, and it felt like a better representation of the way humans inherently played everywhere um, but it wasn't complete because it didn't have that rough and tumble and object oriented types of play and so I got interested in play research and understanding that like if you look just at physical play everybody all children do locomotive play which is like parkour they do mm. object oriented play like you know blocks and sticks mm -hmm. and throwing balls and they do uh, rough and tumble play 
social relational play. And so I was like, well, we should, we should be doing all of those within our practice was my sense mm -hmm. uh, right from 2005, 2006. And then I got involved in, in kind of the redevelopment of an older French method of physical culture called méthode naturelle back then. And so I was cultivating those ideas. And then 2007, I discovered the work of Frank Frensich and Zuber and Animal, um, which became a big touchdown in diving deeper into play research and understanding um, all of this through the lens of play. And so that was sort of gestating within me for several years as I started the first parkour gym on the West Coast or co-founded the first parkour gym on the West Coast. Um, and we were bringing these play-based ideas into how we were teaching people there. And I started a, you know, a, a martial arts rough housing aspect of it. Mm. So then in 2013, I left the gym and started teaching seminars around this idea. Um, and it was very much around uh, like th these is primal, like ancestral perspectives on how a human being should move connected to play and play as this fundamental motivation. Mm. And then in 2014, I think was when I really started thinking about this idea of, at the time I called it the self-worth esteem. Like I thought we got the conversation backwards. It wasn't so much that we had a lack of self-esteem in our culture. Mm. It was that we, that it's, a, it's kind of like a design fault of capitalism um, okay. that it, because of the, the, if the system is optimal, optimized for capital production, then it wants each individual mm -hmm. to spend as much time as possible where they have a comparative advantage. Mm. So like hierarchy, or does it have um, something to do with that? Or what does, do you mean by comparative advantage? So let's say that, you know, we'll just say that there's like five core skills. We'll just call them whatever. It's like cooking, cleaning, fighting, um, you know, uh, me mechanical skills, whatever, whatever the skills are, we'll call them, yeah. we'll have four, right? If I have a, if, if we're exactly the same across three of them and I'm a 10% advantage in one of them, then I can get more in a trade with you by spending all my time on the one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So cap, we produce more capital by getting people that, to, um, to specialize their efforts in the areas where they have the greatest comparative advantage. Mm, okay. Right. So if you have a town that's, you know, that has a water mill and it's right next to, you know, an area that has good um, grain production, it's like everyone's going to is going to grow lots of grains rather than making sure that they also have animals sure. because they can trade with the next village over to get the, the animals. And so that's how trade works, which is great. And it's mm -hmm. enriched the entire world. But if you look at it as a system over time, what it's done has actually been incentivized people to abandon more and more of the the production of the things that give their lives meaning mm. right so no. uh like we we don't sing anymore yeah. we let professionals do that mm. right we don't dance anymore we let professionals do that we don't cook our own food anymore we let mm. professionals do that we don't even have sex anymore we let <laughs> professional students i hope that's not true <laughs> <laughs> statistically statistically you can you can look at like the rise of internet porn and you can see the decrease of people's actual rates of sexuality oh wow yeah so so no we literally are sort of um uh externalizing sexuality mm. to a professional class mm. that's how crazy it is that's crazy so a couple of things are coming up for me when i'm listening to you uh, outline this this philosophy in this program. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing is there's a there's a like Kabbalistic Hasidic teaching that you're supposed to always be in a state of play, mm -hmm. like that is that is like yeah. the most optimal way to be. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering like, and you're you've obviously already touched upon it, but how would you define play? And also, you said earlier that something along the lines of our lives require movement in order to have meaning and yeah. I understand that intuitively because I'm a dancer uh I mean dance is my primary art form I would say I also love to DJ and DJ is a meditative it's a kind of meditative movement practice for me because I'm moving through sound when I'm yeah. DJing very similar to dance um, but I'm curious, what does play mean to you? And also, why do you think we need movement to have meaning? Yeah, okay. So 
what does play mean? That that's such a funny thing because like even the researchers on play have a hard time defining it. Okay, and interesting. If you look at like linguistically, like we have this very strong distinction between work and play in, yeah. in English and really in all the kind of Northern European languages. But if you if you look at a lot of indigenous cultures, mm -hmm. you'll find that the word that they use to describe some kids running around and playing tag is actually the same word that they would use to describe, uh, you know, a mother, you know, uh, grinding some grain. It's physical mm -hmm. activity. Yeah. They, have, they just have one word for physical activity. Mm. Um, but within play research, they, the, the, the core idea of play is that it is intrinsically motivated or autotelic. It's not, mm. it, doesn't, it doesn't exist for some other end. Mm. So when you see two puppies chasing each other and tackling each other, there's no food that's going to be output at the end of that, sure. right? Now, when the adult dog goes and chases a rabbit, then there's a food that's, a, that's an output. But the purpose of it is, is just to fulfill itself. That's what mm -hmm. autotelic means, it's, it's its own end. So anything that has intrinsic motivation and is autotelic could be seen as, as play. One of the things that we find that's interesting about play is that it tends to take the form of, of repeating behaviors with variation. Mm. So you, you'll do, you'll, you'll chase and wrestle, but you'll do it slightly differently every time. Mm. Um, and then you can even go down and say that there's actually neural circuits that are specifically associated with play. This is uh, the work of Jakob Pinksepp. I know you're a big fan of uh, Jordan Peterson. He talks about Jakob Pinksepp and his rats all the time. So okay. Pinksepp discovered that, that if you take two little rats and you let them, um, you basically, you let them play in an arena and then you bring them back to the arena and they can get access to it. They'll work incredibly hard to get access to play. Mm. And you can, you can go in and put electrodes in their brains or imaging and find that there's a specific areas of the brain that are lighting up in anticipation of play or, or during play. And it's a, it's a reward circuitry that's distinct from the reward circuitries associated with like food reward mm. or sex or dominance. So it's built right into us. And it's really fascinating to evolutionary biologists because it has no direct survival purpose, mm. but animals will work really hard to do it. In fact, they've shown in macaques that they will, that when they're under, um, uh, when they're under nutritional stress, they will still play even when the energy they burn in play means that it retards their growth. They will mm -hmm. slow down their growth physically in order to get access to play. Mm. That so, sounds familiar because when I'm stressed, I will dance even though yeah. <laughs> it will wear and tear on my body. And, yeah. and I will stay out dancing till four in the morning, which is not necessarily most yeah. healthiest thing to do but like I, I crave it so that makes a lot of sense to me. yeah so I think of play as this intrinsic drive to explore mm. in ways that that essentially uh, they attune that the, the way that you play is always reflective of your, the evolutionary history of your species right mm. all human children love to play, climb trees but dogs don't mm -hmm. right yeah. Dogs love to chase things and bite things and, and play tug of war. That's how dogs catch their prey. Um, cats love to stalk and pounce, bite mm. things, right? Yeah. It's, it's reflective of the evolutionary origin. So your play is actually, it's sort of like evolution's built in guide for these are the things you should be practicing to become mm. a competent adult of your species. Um, climbing trees. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. For a human being, you got to climb trees. Yeah. Um, and, and it, but the other interesting thing is play builds behavioral flexibility. Mm. And this is a point again that, that Pearson makes, which I think is really interesting. You take a, a rat, right? And you, you put it in a new environment. Uh, first, it's gonna be terrified and it's not gonna do anything. Then it's gonna start exploring. And you can look at the, there's neural circuitry associated with explore, exploration. Once it's explored its environment multiple times, it will discover all the resources. Here's somewhere that I can bed down. Here's some water, here's some food. But all of a sudden, after a little while, it will start playing with how it uses its environment. It'll start changing and adding variations. And what you can think of that is that now, if something changes, the animal has become more adaptable to novelty. It can oh. adjust its behavior when a change happens. And that's what we find when play is denied animals or individuals, they become much less um, flexible to change. So it, it, it's very important for behavioral yeah. flexibility. 
So that's sort of the answer around play. And then we can okay. get into movement, but do you have any sure. follow-up questions on play before I do? Um, well, I was gonna ask a question that might take off, take us off into a tangent, but so okay. I will try to remember and hold off on that and I'll let you answer the second question. Okay. <laughs> so why is movement fundamental to cultivating meaning in life? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, essentially everything grounds out in movement because we, we yeah. exist in order to move. Mm -hmm. I was just writing an essay about this. Um, Daniel Wolpert did a famous TED talk on um, the C squirt, right? And what is a brain for? A brain is actually to control movement. That's its primary purpose. Mm. The C squirt is an animal that is kind of in the, the stem group. It's like really closely related to chordates, which is what we are vertebrates. Okay. Um, and so they have this tube of nerves that controls a muscular tail that powers them to the ocean. However, they have a second life stage where they become uh, they become what's called sessile. They, they basically attach to a rock and become something like a muscle or an oyster. Mm. And at that stage, they'll actually digest the neural tissue in their body and they'll lose this, this, this notochord that's similar to what a chordate has. They basically digest their brain when they become, when they become couch potatoes. Okay. Um, <laughs> what a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the, the actual purpose of the brain mm -hmm. is to control movement. And human beings, of course, have the most complex nervous systems that we've ever created. And we tend to think of that as primarily because we can think. Mm -hmm. But what we don't recognize is that thinking is really bootstrapped on top of motor control. Human beings are not only the most flexible in thinking, we also have, also have the broadest ability to, to change our motor behavior. Mm -hmm. Human beings are the only animal that mimics other animals. Really? We're the yeah. only animal that does that? I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. So if you go to any tribal people in the world, they, they practice dances and shamanistic practices that allow them to embody the mind of the predators and prey animals in their environment. Mm. Right? But they have to physically act it out. If you watch uh, a, um, a tracker you know, who's tracking mm -hmm. game, yeah. you know, he doesn't just think about it. He physically makes himself into the animal and imagines himself in the animal's position going around and saying, okay, this is how it would have moved. So now we, we can go that way. Yeah. We, we don't realize how deeply, and this is a point that our, our friend John Vicky makes. Notice what I said. I said deeply, that's a physical, mm. it's a physical direction in order to, in order to use my mind, I'm having to reference physical Mm. um physical reference uh, analogies right our whole our whole way of understanding standing under things is yeah. through physical analogies so the the meaning in in, in the world is actually re revealed through through movement mm. um i was uh, i was also just listening to uh, one of peterson's lectures where he talks about this and i, I thought it was beautiful he was talking about how essentially we we, we come with these pre-developed uh cognitive frames right um it's like you're hungry that's like a per personality that comes up mm -hmm. and then emotions basically track your ability to to move towards them so it's like you're going to the kitchen and you anticipate your 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 peanut butter sandwich it's good and then you realize your roommates are fighting in there and <laughs> they're like then you have an aversive reaction yeah. you know you stop and so are you getting close to your goal or are you getting further away from your goal? Now you're frustrated. Maybe you got to go down the street to, the, mm -hmm. to Taco Bell, um, oh, right? Um, emotions are downstream of action tendencies because fundamentally what we are as a human being has to express out in mm -hmm. action in order to, to move through the world. So, so we, we think that, you know, we... I think, therefore, I am, cogito yeah. or some, but I would say I move, therefore, I am. It's mm -hmm. actually, thinking is to guide movement. Emotion is to guide movement. Mm. So if you understand that, um, and you start to understand the mind as embodied, embedded, and extended, you start to realize that that's how we actually interact with the meaning in the world. Mm. It, it's revealed to us through acting, through enacting, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other aspect of, of 40 cogs high times. yeah yeah um <clears throat> and then sorry there's one more point i wanted to make about that uh yes that's the point that i was just making which is that 
So a mindfulness practice can teach you about who you are, right? And you can, you can practice metacognition about how you think and how you emote, right? Mm -hmm. And you can do dialoguing practices and you can become better socially, relationally. Mm. But movement is the only thing where every aspect of the self is inherently integrated. You can't move without mm. cognition. You can't move without emotional reactions. You can always see all these things. So that's why for me, movement practice is the base of the self-cultivation. Mm. And we, we see this actually, it's, it's very lost for us in the West, but the, the philosophers, right? The Greek philosophers, where do they first meet? In the gym. In the gymnasia. <laughs> Socrates yeah. and Plato met at the gymnasium. Yeah. And yoga has hatha before mm. pranayama for a reason. And Tashi Shuan is a Taoist practice mm. for a reason. And sumo was practiced at Shinto temples, right? All over we see this. And shamanic practices involve dancing and beating drums and you know going deep into nature. Mm -hmm. The body is integrated into the wisdom practices almost everywhere in the world except in the West. Except for the West. That's so heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and only recently, it's really post-Cartesian, yeah. right? Okay, so we have some hope, is what you're saying. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> we can recover it. But I mean, you, you already pointed one out, Kabbalah. Sure, yeah. Right? And, yeah. and we can go back and see Sufi, right? Sufi yeah. twirling is another, yeah. you know, um, Western Eurasian uh, sure. perspective on movement and meaning. So what are, well, this is a great segue uh, to the question I was gonna ask that I didn't want to get to derail us. Uh, what is the implication or what are the implications of a society such as our own? I mean, historically, let's just take America. I believe, and someone fact checked me on this, but I believe some of the earlier societies that were formed in America that were Puritan or Protestant in nature had rules and very harsh prohibitions on dancing, for example, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. <laughs> so what are the implications of that on a society? And um, how, can we, how can we reawaken to the importance of movement practices like dance if it has been embedded in us that dance or movement in general is something to be devalued, is something to be uh, associated with the devil, for example, yeah, yeah. you know, to take it to the most extreme versions. Like, how do we? It's the devil's music. Yeah, exactly. Like, how right. do we un unlearn that? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, that's at the heart of, of what we're trying to do is to mm -hmm. is to frame movement in such a way that we can help people recover it, mm. right? Like we, you know, that's that's a big part of of what made parkour so profound. Right, parkour. Essentially, parkour is like a reimagining of cityscapes as playgrounds, mm. and it spreads all over the world incredibly rapidly. And and all these kids who might have struggled, like they find it deeply meaningful and get something out of it. People don't realize like parkour comes out of the banlieues. It comes out of right the poor immigrant communities mm. on the outskirts of Paris, and these. Uh, you know, um, famously sort of dehumanizing, brutalist architectures mm. of, of the Ban Lus are where parkour is born. And parkour is like brutalist architecture, which is considered so dehumanizing, is great for parkour. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so so there, there is this power for us to reimagine, mm -hmm. uh, reimagine space and, and define it in new ways. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a, a white American, right? Um, I grew up in the, in the Northwest and um, I, I definitely grew up with this strong cultural sense that dancing was not for men, mm. right? Yeah. Dancing was, which is such a, it's, it's a really fascinating thing culturally to think about. Like, why is it that kind of Northwestern European men have this idea that dancing is feminine, mm. right? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I do think it has something to do with the Protestant Revolution. But. Yeah, it, oh, it definitely <laughs> has something to do with the Protestant Revolution, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But it's, just, it's such a, it's so strange from a, like a broader cultural historical thing. It's like yeah. the dancing is like one of the primary ways yeah. that we, we, that we manage courtship around sure. the world. Sure. Right? It's sure. also yeah. an incredibly powerful tool that's used 
by warriors everywhere to train themselves and yeah. to bond, right? Look at the Hakka. Mm. Right? So, yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, if you want to, if you want to break down some, some barriers to, uh, to, uh, to dance for like the, the hyper-masculine set, mm -hmm. the Hakka is a good, it's a good start. Show okay. them some All Blacks game. <laughs> um, so I think, I guess my general perspective on something like that question is when, when people have like a, an inhibition towards something, mm -hmm. you need to recognize what it come, where it comes from if you can and mm -hmm. try, to, try to, to take that away and then show them how something that they already value is contained within In this it. thing and then yeah. they get some extra benefit. Okay. So um, if you if you say that everybody knows that exercise is important, say, so, okay, well, you can come burn calories <laughs> doing this this dance practice with me, mm -hmm. right? But you're actually gonna have fun too. Yeah. On top of and that. You, and you might meet some attractive person. Yeah. <laughs> whatever sex is attractive to you right yeah you might spark a mating call dance yeah. and you didn't even realize that that's what you're yeah. doing yeah so, so so that's that's kind of my approach to to it and mm. and for me uh, i guess the i think that there's two, two i think of my work as kind of at the intersection between sort of the meaning conversation that john Raveki and jordan peterson john from and mm -hmm. folks like yourself are having and the, the movement conversation Mm -hmm. And so what I'm kind of trying to do is to get people in the movement community to say, hey, what we're doing can be much more than it is. It can mm -hmm. actually be the fundamental grounds for like a wisdom practice. And then do you think do you find that a lot of people in the movement tradition don't necessarily see what they're doing as a part of that larger wisdom practice cultivation? Um, so fitness in general is very much start, stuck in a Cartesian body as object type sure. worldview, right? Yeah. The movement community is already the community that's moving away from that. Like mm. parkour, when it started, was all about parkour philosophy. Everyone was, was super passionate about this concept that nobody could actually describe well. <laughs> um, it's very input, but still yeah. really important to all of us, you know, late teen boys, early mm -hmm. 20s men. Um, and um, and so I'm, it's definitely growing. Like there's a huge yeah. group of, of people who got inspired by Jordan Peterson mm. within the movement community. And then, uh, you know, and then John Bravaki is now you know, definitely spreading through, through those communities as well. Um, so it's there. And, you know, I have people reaching out to me and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this as how do we look at this as a wisdom tradition? Mm. Um, and just generally what you'll find, what we've discovered is that if you, if you meet anybody who's been doing a movement practice for like 15, 20 years and you ask them why they do it, they'll always, the, the answer kind of grounds out and it's meaningful. Hmm. Right? It's like, I like who I am better yeah. when I'm here. I, you know, I experience the flow state. I, yeah. I, um, my character develops. I become a stronger person. I learned that you know, like a lot of people who go to martial arts, they do it really specifically to regulate their aggression. Mm. It's like, if I, if I can get that here, then I don't have to do it. Then I don't, you know, I don't have the same. It's like the, all the little insults that might make you start wanting to engage in a physical confrontation, that kind of the volume gets turned down on them once yeah. you get that experience. I um, did see, I did see on your website, something that said, there's a connection between martial arts and being able to channel aggression and also mm -hmm. even cultivate empathy Yes, because yeah. of that capacity to channel aggression. Can you mm -hmm. speak a little bit about the connection between those two things? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, again, Dan Boak Peterson, he actually has a paper called um, uh, Rough and Tumble Play and the Regulation of Aggression. And he did research mm. showing that in between two to four years old is basically when people learn to regulate aggression mm. and there are there are some kids who hit and you know bite and steal more than mm. other kids mm. and the most powerful thing that you can do for them is actually give them lots of access to rough and tumble play 
Mm. And the reason for that is that it's highly, highly motivating and people will stop playing with you <laughs> when you hurt them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so because it has this huge motivational drive and it's, and you can kind of, you have to figure out the other player's um, desire. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the two little rats, right? If you have one that's 10% bigger than the other, the first time that they, they wrestle and they wrestle, the larger rat will pin the smaller rat's shoulders on the ground. Mm -hmm. So they pin each other just like we do. Even, in, even venomous snakes do pins. It's mm -hmm. pretty crazy how common that is throughout the animal kingdom. Yeah. So, but, so if, they, if you allow them then to, to wrestle repeatedly, the smaller rat will, will initiate play, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a dominance relationship where the, the subdominant animal has to initiate the play. Mm -hmm. If the dominant animal is good at playing, he will then handicap himself or herself such that the other animal is successful some of the time. And if he doesn't mm. do that sufficiently, the small animal will stop initiating play. And that, that ratio is about 30% of the time. So if you're the bigger animal and you don't let the smaller animal have about 30% success, um, then they'll stop initiating play with you. Mm. So that's basically the beginning of an iterated game and theory of mind. Right. And then it's empathy, right? Because in order, in order for me to realize why you've stopped playing with me, I have to realize that you also want to experience winning. Right. <laughs> right. right. You, have you, have to, to, you have to be able to identify the need behind. Yeah. Yeah. And we watch this with kids, you know, they, when they play, they get scared and they mm. feel hurt and they get emotionally upset and then they have to negotiate and figure that out. It yeah. becomes this really profound grounds for, for the cultivation of self. Um, I, I read this book called the serious um, guide to puppy training years and years and years ago <laughs> okay um and in this book they were saying when a puppy puppies inherently want to play with their mouths because mouths are like hands for dogs mm. and so they they're going to want to bite you and they're going to want a rough house with you and, you know if you've ever played with a puppy you know how excited they get to do this kind of rough housing play um but they're probably going to bite you too hard eventually <laughs> and it hurts right yeah. like sharp little puppy teeth you're saying you should never train a dog to just not bite at all mm. in that stage because mm -hmm. they will dogs actually need to have bite control they need to have really good motor control of their mouths and they develop it through this game mm. and so then if they if they're denied if they're immediately shut down every time that they engage in this kind of play they won't have any sort of force control so mm. when they bite and they're actually so first of all if they bite they won't have any ability to control the power of their bite which is bad that's dangerous yeah. But second of all, it also produces more anxiety in the dog and makes them more likely to be fear biters because mm. they develop confidence and the sense of what they are through this game. And I immediately was like, well, this is just human beings. Yeah. Right. And I actually like this is totally speculative on my part. I don't mm -hmm. think that anyone has done this research, though. Actually, I take that back. Stuart Brown has done research that indicates this. Mm. I think that one of the reasons why we have um a problem with spree shooters in this country mm. is because of a lack of rough and tumble play. Interesting. Okay. Because that is the dog that bites because it has no, it has no inhibitory control. It has no ability to regulate the levels of its violence. So these wow. kids usually have no, they're not violent until they're ultra violent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is very Jungian actually. Um, yeah because Jung was very much interested in this concept called the shadow and define the shadow as all the things yeah. that we try to hide about ourselves and suppress about ourselves or within ourselves and a way to sort of get in right relationship with the shadow or with, let's say the emotions that emerge from the shadow. Let's say, you know, I feel uh, angry and I grew up in a home where anger wasn't exactly uh allowed to be expressed mm -hmm. um and so i grew up as a result trying to suppress my anger <laughs> oftentimes and of yeah. course that backfires because that creates anxiety and that just um similar to you know the dog that you just uh described but i have learned 
and I am learning that if I'm able to get in right relationship with that anger, if I'm able to simply express when I'm angry and let the anger come and go, just as the waves in the ocean come and go, then I'm actually able to speak to someone when I'm angry, but with a way that's in a way that's far more rooted and far less impulsive and far more, um, I don't know if dignified is the right way, but basically in a way where I'm speaking with the energy of anger, but I'm speaking to them in a way that like, I still am acknowledging your inherent worth and dignity as a human being when I am expressing this anger towards you, as opposed to the sort of impulsive, uncontrollable, flailing anger. Um, so I can yeah. see, I can see how what you're saying manifests within my own life. And I have a, you know, I follow John Pravicki's meditation practices, which includes a movement practice. Um, and I also do a exercise practice called functional patterns. And I also dance. So I can see how like all of these things can really help a person to self-regulate. And it's ironic because going back to sort of the Protestant elements of the Protestant tradition, which I think ultimately wanted to, was so terrified of the shadow that it wanted to suppress the shadow. But if what you're saying is true, then the very things that we were trying to avoid, like shooting sprees, right, yeah. are actually a product of that suppression. And mm -hmm. it's counterintuitive. We wouldn't necessarily put two and two together, but, but that's what um, actually comes out of that kind of suppression, as opposed to learning to be in right relationship with all elements of yourself. Yeah. So uh, one of my friends, Rory Miller, said something I really like. He said that we are today in our relationship to violence where we were in the 1950s as a culture in our relationship to sex. Mm. Right? It's this huge taboo, super yeah. suppressed. And then when it leaks out, it leaks out in very uncontrolled ways. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. like I have uh, I have a nine-year-old daughter, right? She's you know just coming into puberty. Mm -hmm. um, and she has a crush. And it's like, I'm thinking a lot about like, I don't want to, I don't want to be like, you're in a box until you're 25. <laughs> right? Yes. Despite the father's like uh, <laughs> drive or impulse to do that. Yeah. yeah. Protective it's impulse. Like, yeah. A healthy adult is going to have sexuality as part of who right. they are. Right. But also there's a lot of unhealthy expressions of sexuality. Right. So I don't think we get to the healthy expressions of sexuality by just trying to cut off all mm -hmm. the other ones. Right. You have to you have to recognize them and mm -hmm. create a space around them. It's the same thing with 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 the um, with anger, right? Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea that, that Peterson talks about. That you should think of anger as a personality. Mm -hmm. it, it's a mode of being that you can inhabit. When you're a two year old, when anger takes over, it takes over completely. You're entirely the the angry version of you, right? Mm, yeah. Um, but what happens between two and four, if you have good, good sort of, uh, if you have the right kind of environment mm -hmm. um, and good development is that this, the, the sort of controlling consciousness, the Jiminy Cricket, right? Mm, yeah. He, he's, he's able to not, not shove the anger into, into the basement, right? Mm -hmm. But get it to come to the table and negotiate well mm -hmm. with everybody else, <laughs> right? Yeah. So he's, so that's that's what you want to experience. Like you, when you're when you're dealing with a work situation or a situation with your roommates or a situation with partners, if you completely your diet deny yourself access to anger, mm -hmm. you you actually put yourself in danger. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, if your if your anger, um, if your id is always riding you mm. <laughs> rather than being ridden by you then that's not very healthy either right i had a yeah that's i guess that's a little bit of a tangent but i've experienced this right i i mm. I, rem, I a couple of years ago i was working uh, with somebody and um i i had taken on too many projects and i was just exhausted and mm. this exhaustion created this sense of apathy in me and i got a signal from this person that they were very narcissistic and they were taking advantage of me mm. and i I felt the beginning of the anger, but it just sort of like died. <laughs> mm. There just wasn't enough energy in the system to sustain the anger. And I kind of didn't respond to the 
situation. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up getting way more taken advantage of. And I was like, oh, interesting. That's not where I thought this was going. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In that moment, if I had been able to really if my if the angry part of myself had actually been able to rise up a little bit it would have given me a lot deeper insight in the situation yeah yeah that requires some kind of balance which of course is not as Raviki says is not some fixed thing but it has to constantly be (laughs) grasped for um yeah no that's very interesting I for me when I have found like I feel physically unwell when I suppress my anger because I, I feel it in my belly I feel mm-hmm. like resentful and you know because I'm not able to express and of course it's not the other person's fault that I'm not able to express that I haven't become mm-hmm. aligned and centered uh, enough to be able to express but it's so interesting today literally just today I was on the bus I was riding the bus and I didn't have my mask on Um, I had my mask like around my ankle, my, uh, my wrist, wrist, but, but um, I didn't have it on. And, and I got on the bus and I have ridden the bus for a long time, even when I was back home in New Orleans. And I have this very like specific thing about saying good morning to the bus driver. It's like, you you have to do it. Like, it's like, it's like a ritual. So I go on the bus and I'm feeling very cheerful and I say good morning to the bus driver, but he doesn't respond. I hear some honking. I look up and I realize that he's honking. My immediate assumption is that he's honking at another bus because oftentimes when buses pass, they honk at each other, but he continues to honk. And then I look at him and he goes like this because he has his mask on. Yeah, yeah. And so I realize he's telling me to put on my mask. And so I'm like, I immediately say, oh yes, yes, I'm, I'm gonna put it on. And then I said to him, like, immediately, I was like, by the way, you can communicate that to me directly. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. And, and I, I would have never been the person in, in the past to, like, immediately communicate the way I felt, which was for me, like, speak to me human to human. Like, don't, if you need me to put my mask on, that's fine. I have no problem t- putting my mask on. But, like, don't do it in a dehumanizing way don't honk at me like i'm a passenger like speak to me human to human and i looked at him like dead in the eyes and then i just walked (laughs) just walked it and so i feel like i am actively learning how to channel that anger in a way that's strong but also rooted and also like like i said earlier like i'm 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 acknowledging your humanness and, and that's where the anger is coming from. I need you to acknowledge my humanity as well. Yeah. Yeah. We, there, there is such a thing as well-regulated aggression. Yeah. <laughs> and and there, like there's mature responses. It's like, um, you know, I, I would never tell my kids never hit somebody. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's like, a good point. If someone yeah. is trying to take your life, hit them, hit yeah. them as hard as you can. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I tell them we don't hit out of anger right? We don't hate right. just to, just to punish somebody. Right. right. Um, but, but I give them lots of opportunities to, to do, engage in rough and tumble play with. Them. Mm. And, you know, I think I was really lucky in the temperament of my children. Mm. Um, so it's not just that, but it's amazing to see how well regulated they are in that area. Mm. Like it's something that like, um, my, my daughter's never hit anybody out of anger. My oldest daughter mm. in any of her school years. Like as, a, as a preschooler, et cetera. Um, you know, it happened only a couple of, like my two youngest children hit me and my, my, my wife like two or three times, mm-hmm. right? like very, very few. Mm-hmm. But I think it's really because like, they have a totally unique experience because I'm like, if they, if they want to punch me in the face, right? <laughs> <laughs> as part of a game, then they get to. Yeah. Right? It's like, if, you know, my son now has been doing martial arts since mm. he was four years old and he can hit really hard. Mm. Um, and so I have to be like, no, you, you actually have to ask me now. Yeah. But like for, for years, he could just initiate roughhousing by like running over and punching me. Yeah. And, and now it's like, well, but now you hit hard. So now you have to say, dad, uh, hey, can I hit you? Because yeah. <laughs> I need to keep my organs intact. Yeah. Um, but, but it's amazing how that that's resulted in, you know, their much greater exposure to the tools of violence mm-hmm. has, has resulted in them being 
far more in control of inhibiting, mm. right? Like I've watched kids try to start fights with my son in the playground where they're like, really, and he just, you know, he can just hold them away <laughs> and stop the fight. And, and he doesn't, he's, he, he's confused by their lack of regulation of their aggression. Yeah. He's upset. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting to watch. That's really beautiful. I mean, I'm, I would be curious to, well, two things. I'm very interested in practicing uh, Aikido. Mm -hmm. It's come up multiple different times. Like it just come up. I've seen it. I've heard of it. Um, I'm drawn to it. I'm curious if you would have any advice on that. Uh, and then the second thing is what, have you thought about this relationship between violence and nonviolence, right? Because there is this sort of like, if we look in the African-American tradition and we look into the figures of Malcolm X and the figures of Dr. King and Dr. King was this sort of like Zen centered, I'm going to channel the energy that you're putting out, but in a nonviolent way. Whereas Malcolm X was sort of arguably in touch with his aggression, although both were in touch with their aggression, but in different ways. So what is, what is the relationship or the impact that the conversation that we're having uh, can have on this? What do you think it can have on this Malcolm X, Dr. King uh, yeah. situation, you know? Yeah, I, I've, I've listened to you tell this story of, um, of Malcolm, I, I'm sorry, I think it's Martin Luther King working with his, um, the, the protesters who were working with yeah. and physically having them assault each other. Yeah. In order yeah. to get Rough them to have the emotional, yeah. yeah in, in order to teach them to have, in order to teach them actually to not dehumanize their assaulters. Right. Exactly. Uh, I just found that it's so profound. It's such a beautiful thing. And I think that, yeah, if we, if we have kids who engage in rough and tumble play, they're going to be better able to do that. And I yeah. think that part of what's happening in the, the sort of, um, the, Oh man, this is getting a little political. So uh, it's okay. But, I don't. I don't you know, mind. <laughs> so, but it, it connects here. Hmm. I think that we have a generation of people who have very poor regulation of aggression. That we have a generation of people whose emotions are regulated by by circumstance rather hmm. than by by personal resources. Hmm. So we've created an incentive structure that makes it very easy to be nonviolent. Hmm. Um, but we haven't created people who are inherently nonviolent. So we have all this violence ah, that's, that's coming out yeah. through social media, yeah. right? It's coming, like people, people are, people desperately want to go hurt somebody, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And so they do it, they do it online. And a lot of it is, is taking place under the idea of, of the righteous cause of social justice. Right. And I was thinking about um, after, the, after what happened to George Floyd, you know, mm -hmm. there were all these con uh, conflicts. And by then I had learned that um, you have to be really careful when you speak about these things. Mm -hmm. sure. And, and I, was, I was upset about what, how I was seeing people talk about what was going mm -hmm. on because, um, because, you know, I've, I've been in the martial arts for a long time. I've worked with law enforcement. I know, I know yeah. a little bit about that. And um, I just couldn't, you know, I didn't know how to respond. And, and I knew that I wasn't coming from the right place and where I wanted to respond from. So mm -hmm. I went out into the woods and I sat down and I meditated for a long time. And I had this image all of a sudden that came into my mind of fire moving through a forest. Mm. And I could see two forests. One is a forest where the fire is, where the, the, the ecology is healthy and the fire just burns off the dead wood. And then right. the new growth just springs forth more beautifully and more powerfully mm. directly afterwards. Now there is a forest where, where there's too much detritus that's been built up, mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 it kills the it kills the heartwood of the of the trees, and then it takes generations to fix it. Right? And mm -hmm. I felt like the expression of anger that was coming out was unregulated. Right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't actually building, but it was like there's there's really good reasons for it. Right? Mm -hmm. and at the time I like I wanted to say, like the the problem of of lethal police violence towards young black men is vastly over exaggerated mm -hmm. right but it's hard to say that and and get the nuances right 
because mm-hmm. it's vastly over exaggerated now right <laughs> but the <laughs> but the pro- yeah. but the problem of but the problem of 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 physical violence so there's like is lethal violence a problem not really it's being exaggerated is mm-hmm. violence in general a problem well yeah there's mm-hmm. still about 50 percent more violence that the african-american community is experiencing yeah. than the white community and also like how long do you have to go back right before the thing that we're saying is happening now actually was happening right how much not very how far much, yeah <laughs> not very far back yeah how much grief is still being experienced by that community how much right. of that is not processed how much of that is the the extra fuel in the forest right. that hasn't been been dealt with right right talk about yeah. we'll talk about channeling anger properly but also how much how how little have we learned to be in right relationship with our sorrow also yeah. Right. Yeah. So all of these energies are present and percolating within us and we don't have the tools. We don't have the toolkit to actually yeah. be able to channel them in in proper ways. Yeah. Have you ever heard there's a, there's a band called The War on the Treat. Are you familiar with them? Mm-hmm. There's a beautiful song called uh, Lonely in My Grief, which is basically mm-hmm. written from a black perspective towards the white community. Like, where mm-hmm. were you when I was so lonely in my grief? Yeah. Like, what has happened? Um, so so like so i didn't say anything on social media at that time Mm -hmm. i just i was like it wasn't worth it but i did talk to a few of my black friends and say hey here's what i understand about the statistics but i also understand like why you might be pissed off (laughs) and like (laughs) you need to talk to me about it like i'm here to to listen to what you have to say Mm -hmm. um and that seemed to be really useful for those few people who Mm -hmm. i was able to to have those conversations with to to approach it in that way and and it, it was interesting how that was different from what they were experiencing from the people who who were wanting to be shriven of their guilt mm, yeah well yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of my friends told me it was like right after that the george floyd killing like i felt like i had a lot of friends mm. <laughs> had a lot of white friends mm. and then i realized they just wanted to talk about how they felt <laughs> right about yeah. their guilt yeah um so that's a, that's a little bit of a tangent but um but i think that in this in this martin luther king versus versus um malcolm x thing like ultimately i think you have to be capable of Mm. utilizing violence right Mm. like i think you know like uh, in a game theoretical standpoint if you're Mm. if you're always a dove then you will actually incentivize hawkish behavior Mm. right we know that through through different games that altruistic punishment is really important for the development of like stable um, uh, people defaulting towards pro-social behavior Mm -hmm. in order to stabilize that there has to people have to be willing to lose something in order to in order to punish somebody who's behaving negatively Mm. that said like the, the problem with anger is that it's it's um it's kind of addicting right yeah and and so i think that you want to cultivate the capacity to to use the sword if you have to mm-hmm. and then you, you want to cultivate the capacity to choose not to as many times as possible <laughs> yeah so that's that's a really important distinction to be able to say i am consciously choosing not to use the sword as mm-hmm. opposed to, I don't know how to use the sword. Yes, yes. That's really important. You have to be, you have to be, you know, to, to quote Jordan Peterson again, you have to be a monster, <laughs> yeah. a controlled monster. Yeah. Right. And I think that, um, that through the martial arts, we can do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I don't know, you said something about Aikido earlier. Yeah. Um, I'm very uh, inter- interested in, in I, I have too many practices going on right now, yeah, but yeah. I'm interested in, and adopting that as well. I think Aikido is, there's some beautiful ideas in it, but it's very disconnected from reality. It, really? It has, okay. It has, it has bad epistemology. Oh, um, that's and so, to hear. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that is within jujitsu, right? Mm. Jujitsu, so jujitsu means the art of yielding. And mm. um, Aikido and Judo and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu all descend from the same thing they all descend from jiu-jitsu mm. right? um i uh aikido actually really in some sense specifically comes from aiki jiu-jitsu which is 
jujitsu for a sword, right? Mm. It's how to fight unarmed against somebody with a sword. Mm. But all of the martial arts in some sense have, if they're well developed and they have the philosophical, they talk about the balance between hardness and softness. Mm -hmm. right? So sometimes the appropriate response to force is force. And mm -hmm. sometimes the appropriate response to force is yielding. Mm -hmm. Right. So jujitsu is the art of yielding. But um, like gojuru, karate, that means the hard, soft school. Right. We have mm. these two balances in martial arts. And you see the same thing in the Chinese martial arts. It's called fort and foible in the, uh, in the European martial arts. But we have to cultivate that ability to stand strong in, some, in front of something and also to say, oh, you, you, your fort is taking you there. I'm just going to step aside and maybe give you a little much. Sure. Um, so it, it's a difficult thing because, I mean, you can learn some great things from Aikido. Mm -hmm. um, and the philosophical side. Within the, I, I talk about this idea of the, the Tao versus the Jitsu of martial mm -hmm. arts. Tao, like Aikido, that Do is mm -hmm. Tao, right? Mm -hmm. Tao De Ching. It's the same, mm -hmm. it's the Japanese version. Mm -hmm. So it means way, right? Mm -hmm. There's something that's happened where many martial arts have gone from a jitsu, which is a set of techniques, right? You could have a jitsu of, of you, you can have a jitsu of being a cook. You can have a jitsu of being a firefighter. And it can literally just be like, this is how you, you know, this is how you get the hose out, right? Sure. You know, so it's got no metaphysical significance at all. Sure. Right? And then it can become a dough. It mm -hmm. can become something that you go to, to cultivate yourself. Mm -hmm. right? uh, have you read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? No, my one of my good friends insists that I do, but I do practice Taoism. I try to read yeah. a page from the from the Tao Te Ching every morning, and of course, I by practicing Verveki's meditations, there there's also they're also heavily influenced by parts of it are heavily influenced by Taoism. So, yeah, 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 Taoism is a huge touchstone for him. So, so Zen, the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, was actually inspired by another call, book called Zen and the Art of Archery, um, mm. and that was about this German guy's experience of trying to learn Zen and traditionally Zen of course is, is Buddhism refracted through Taoism. That's basically mm. what Zen is. Um, so Zen, he's trying to learn the, the Zen path, but in order to learn the Zen path at that time in Japan, you have to choose a subsidiary art. You can't get to mm -hmm. Zen without having a physical, art that you do so it can yeah. be tea ceremonies it could be painting it could be archery so he chose archery so the point of that is that um that the way that they approach archery isn't just to teach you archery it's that the archery is a path to the self-cultivation it's mm -hmm. the dough within the martial arts we have tended they've tended to break into focus on being technically competent in sport mm -hmm. and and the self-cultivation. Mm -hmm. um, so Aikido is self-cultivation. Tashi Shuan is self-cultivation. Um, Bagua, uh, Bagua Jing Yi, um, and then like Muay Thai, mm. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, these are very, very much about, you know, what the people who go there are mostly interested in, like what is the technical component that's gonna allow me to beat the other guy in sure. the sport. Okay. But, the problem that I have is that the real lessons come in the hard sparring, mm. right? Sure. And, and that there's a tendency for um, spiritual bullshittery mm. in the arts that are dough oriented, mm. right? You'll see all these people who think that they can push you over with their chi. <laughs> sure. Right. Watch some, uh, yeah. watch some uh, Steven Seagal demonstrations of him doing like keto. It's not okay. a good thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so what we do with, with what well, we're, I actually believe that parkour in some sense is the perfect vehicle to reunite these two mm. elements mm -hmm. because, um, because it's just a relationship between you and the environment. Mm -hmm. you, you can go slow enough to really start to engage in metacognition about how your, how the dough is expressing for you. Mm. You can go slow in parkour. In the sense that um, I can stop and consider what's happening, right? Mm. When I'm in a sparring match, when I'm in a competition, 
the the pace is being dictated by the other guy sure right i don't get to be like oh i'm feeling afraid right now of what's about to happen can yeah. you stop for a second i'm going to meditate <laughs> on what it's like to experience fear yeah okay, now i'm going to put myself back in that position and we're going to keep going right i see yeah so that live element obviously is also very important i like the, the combination yeah. of the two but that's essentially what we're really trying to do with the mm. play is to mm. to take people to to show people how the physical practice can 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 you know ground out in meaning mm -hmm. and give you a pathway to that and wisdom um mm -hmm. but do it in a way that that has solid epistemology and mm -hmm. that cultivates real skill all the way up right that, that makes a lot of sense as you're saying this i'm thinking of the other movement practice that i'm drawn to which is yeah. capoeira yeah and it seems like that would have both that first of all it has a dance thing which i'm attracted to but it also has a partner dynamic which i think maybe by maybe can bypass the bullshittery that you mentioned um <laughs> yeah capoeira i love capoeira capoeira is one of yeah. my favorite arts and i think it's it's one of the most fascinating arts to try to study from the perspective of what is a movement culture mm. one of the really cool things about capoeira is it's it's actually very hard to define what it is right mm. Like we have this this sort of like martial art um, module in our brain, like ah, capoeira martial art. It's like sticking its arms out all over the place, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, oh, maybe it's a dance. It's like, no, it's not quite. Yeah. Like in in Brazil, it's it has its own designation. It's a folklore art, but mm -hmm. capoeira has. They really want you to learn the instruments. Mm -hmm. They really want you to learn the stories and the songs. Um, mm -hmm. So it has a whole folklore, it has a whole mythology, and then it has um, the dance element and then the combative element, and it has all these partnering elements. And you will, you will develop real skills in capoeira, right? Mm. Like capoeiristas are amazing movers. Uh, mm. Years and years ago, I was talking to a Cirque du Soleil um, recruiter, and we're talking about which athletes were best able to, to do new challenges. Mm. So this is the gymnast, this is the parkour athletes, this is like, it's actually the capoeiristas, wow. right? If you have if you have if you have a bunch of people and they're like, okay, here's the new challenge that nobody has ever tried, and everybody comes over and tries it, it's the capoeiristas. And he's like, yeah. but they also lose interest the fastest and go back to the whole <laughs> right? They just want to do their thing. Yeah, <laughs> it has all these amazing elements because it has um, interaction that's live, right? It's not pre choreographed. Yeah, um, there's there's music, so you're you're playing with the music. It's acrobatic mm. and it's rhythmic. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, I. It also, um, capoeira also is about. Um, capoeira has a has a focus on this idea of uh, uh, malicia, mm. malinjinga, which basically means malice, right? Mm. Mis or the nice way to think about it is mischievousness, mm, mm. right? Yeah. So what you're playing a cooperative game, right? You're both playing in a way that is sort of feeding off of each other. But then within that game, you want to find the moment where you have a beautiful opportunity to trick the other guy and knock him down. <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> yeah. So capoeira communities can be a little bit malicious <laughs> okay. in the background too <laughs> so yeah. that's just where useful to know but yeah. uh yeah it's a fascinating and yeah absolutely that's definitely we get uh, i'm very excited we have some capoeiristas coming to uh to return to the source this year and mm. we'll be bringing that element in because i've studied a little bit but there's only so much that i can share but when somebody who actually can play the instruments yeah. shows up at one of the events we like to like to give them an opportunity to, to share a bit of it because it's such a rich rich movement culture well you're making me really excited about potential of one day just going to brazil for like i don't know six months the year and yeah. running it. i would totally do that like i'm i'm yeah. i'm down for that challenge um well you know, capoeira brazilian jiu-jitsu <laughs> that's a <laughs> lot i don't know about all that that's <laughs> slow your roll that's <laughs> one thing at a time um maybe if i learned capoeira it would it would make me it, it would make it easier for me to learn brazilian jiu-jitsu but oh, for sure. you know maybe not i don't know um we're almost out of time so i want to give you the opportunity to explain 
what return to the source is for anyone yeah. who might be interested. Um, and then we can wrap it up from there. Okay, sounds good. So return to the source is, is a now nine day intensive that we do every summer where we take people through a set of practices of movement, mindfulness, nature, connection, and community um, in order to reveal to them basically how those things can help them live a more deeply meaningful life. Mm. Um, it takes place in Northwest Washington on, um, we, we stay at my family's property, uh, which we've actually had the family since 1920. And mm. my dad, um, is a world famous natural builder cool. who has created cob and straw bale, um, architecture that, you know, people describe as looking like something out of the Lord of the Rings and <laughs> featured in the New York times. Um, we have awesome. saunas and cold plunges and it's just an extraordinary environment. And then we take you around some of the most beautiful uh, natural areas in the Northwest to teach the basics of natural parkour, rough mm. and tumble play, um, body integrity practices, um, games that we play with sticks and balls, uh, like so a real complete approach to kind of play-based movement practices. Um, and then all of that in dialogue with mindfulness, nature mm. connection community. Uh, so there's rituals, there's songs, all the food is fresh and local. Um, mm. So yeah, that's, that's the commercial. We have five spots left <laughs> as of the recording of this, um, <laughs> but we do have two, two seasonal retreats there, four and a half days. If people, people want to okay. get from this. That sounds so beautiful. Yeah. I do want to come at <laughs> least once at some point in my life. Yeah. I plan on making that happen. I don't know when it's yeah. going to happen, but I will definitely be at, at at least one of them in, in the future. So oh, we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Rafe. Thank you so yeah, much absolutely. for intellectually and, and sensually sparring with me today. I've learned <laughs> so much. Um, I'm really excited about what you're doing. It's super, super important to have people understand the importance and the sacredness of movement and, and, and that it should be centered in our lives. So I just want to thank you for sharing your wisdom with my audience and with my community. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, thank you, Chloe. It was, it was a pleasure.